Bright, sunny morning. A little bit warmer today than what it was yesterday. First of all, I would like to announce that the income tax receipts are available, and Nina has them with her, and they will be at downstairs, Nina, or in the office, uh, or at the front door t today and probably next Sunday as well, okay? If you are visiting us for the first time, I would like to welcome you all to our family. Um, we invite you to join us downstairs for coffee following the service. And I would ask that you keep those people that are either ill or in long-term care in your prayers. Our next Bible study starts on March the 4th, so if you are interested in taking that, there is a book that you can get through Amazon, and if you don't have the internet capabilities to do that, if you contact Irma in the office, she will get it for you. I would like to draw your attention to the World Day of Prayer, which is on March the 6th at 1 p.m. at St. Augustine Church. Also, there is a corned beef and cabbage dinner on March the 14th, and there will be raffle baskets for that, so they're looking for individuals to, or groups to donate raffle baskets for that dinner. And also, don't forget, Pancake Tuesday is coming up on the 25th of February, and there will be a luncheon dinner on the 23rd of February following the service, and that is actually Youth Sunday, so there will be quite a few children or whatever in the service. I would like to thank Glenda Hempel for her Ministry of Music today, and I would like to thank Wendell for being with us for the last three weeks and sharing his message. And next Sunday, Reverend Frank and Margita will be back with us. And at this time, I would invite you to please prepare your hearts for worship. Good morning. It is indeed good to be with you again today. I was telling someone earlier, I kind of rushed in because I got excited this morning and I started revamping the sermon, which no pastor is supposed to do, but we all do. Uh, so I was kind of rushing to get here. I had to finally say, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Well, we welcome you to worship this morning. Our call to worship is in the bulletin and will also be on the screen. I invite you to read the bold sections as I read the light print. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the Lord's house. This is where the tribes come, the tribes of Israel, to give thanks to the Lord according to his command. May there be peace inside your walls and safety in your palaces. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I say to Jerusalem, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I pray for your prosperity. Let us pray. Father, we have come to worship you this morning, thanking you for your mercy and your grace. Thanking you for the opportunity that we have in this land to safely worship you without fear. We thank you for the opportunity to live in your grace, to see your mercy wash over us, and to be able to believe in a God who does great things for his children. So we pray that as we worship you this day that you will be present with us through your Holy Spirit, that our hearts will be uplifted to your throne, that the words and the songs that all we do today will give you honor and glory and praise. We thank you for teaching us through this time, and we thank you for teaching us what is so important in our lives as we prepare for the world to come. So we pray together now that prayer that you taught your disciples, and you want us to pray, saying, Our Father, who died in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We pray as you are here today, you will hear God's voice speaking to you and encouraging you in your walk with him. We will sing our song, number 626, I Heard the Voice of Jesus. the children forward at this time. Good morning. Okay, let me try that again. Good morning. How are you this morning? You two are related, aren't you? How do I know that? <laughs> sure, look at that. So, for your parents and, and the adults, we've been talking about churches. What church are you in has been the topic that we've been looking at. The story we're going to tell you today is asking you an important question. What room are you in? Oh, that's sweet. What room are you in? You know in your home, you have different rooms. And in each of those rooms, you kind of act according to which room you are in. If you are in the dining room, what do you normally do there? You eat, very good. If you are in the kitchen, what do you normally do there? Cook, Cook. very good. Don't forget clean. Cook and clean. If you are in the basement or the family room, what do you normally do there? You play, very good. And of course, we know there's a washroom and there's a garage and we won't go into all of that. But in each of those rooms, you do something specifically that matches that room. So when I ask you the question, what room are you in? I am asking you, how do you behave yourself when you're in each of those rooms? How do you act when you're in each of those rooms? So when you are in the dining room, you're not jumping up on the table and skipping. That's not the right place to do that. When you're in your bedroom and mommy or daddy says, okay, it's time to go to sleep, you're not running around the bed screaming like a banshee. You're laying down in bed, quietly going to sleep. God wants you to be that type of person. However, for God, he wants you to be the same in each room. 
He wants you to be same in the house and the same outside. So if God wants you to be nice to people, you should be nice to people where? In the house and outside. Sometimes, however, and I'm going to speak to those old people out there, sometimes we are nicer to the people outside than inside the house. For example, I know it doesn't happen in your house, but I've been to some houses where there's a heavy argument going on and the phone rings and the person says, hello. <laughs> Somehow, God wants us to be just as nice in the house as we are outside. You love Jesus in the house, you love him outside the house. You want to be like Jesus everywhere you are. So no matter what room you're in in your house, you got to be nice. No matter what room you are in your house, if mommy or daddy says, would you please, you said, of course, mommy, I would love to do that. Wow. I know. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? When you come back from the hospital, we'll talk to you. <laughs> Wherever you are, Jesus wants you to be kind and nice. So if mommy says, it's time to do your homework, yes, mom, I'll go do my homework. Do your homework. Can I play now, mommy? No, not right now. Okay, mommy, whatever you say. I, you, <laughs> so I want you guys to practice that this week, being the same nice, loving Christian person in the house and outside the house. And when mommy or daddy asks you to do something, I want you to repeat after me, yes, mommy, I love to do your will. Yes, daddy. Try it, practice. Yes, daddy. I love to do your will. I want you guys to practice those words this week. So no matter whatever room you're in, you're going to be like Jesus. Can we do that? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so. You are the same to us wherever we may be. So give us the strength to be like you wherever we may go. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, children. I know you are hoping your children to do that, but husbands, you have to do that too. Yes, honey. <laughs> oh, oh, you got quiet there, man. Huh? It is time for us to give back to God what he has blessed us with. We want to invite those who are collecting the offering to come forward as we invite you to give back because God continues to give to you. Let us pray. 
Father, we dedicate these offerings to your name's honor and glory. We thank you that as you continue to bless us, we can continue to bless others, that the ministries of this church, that those who need will be blessed because of it. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. If you notice, Glenna played uh, all Negro spirituals this morning, uh, as it is Black History Month. Uh, maybe sometime Reverend Frank, well, I should say that in front of him, it kind of puts him on the spot. We'll do a lovely sermon on Black History for you. Um, the song we'd like to share with you, uh, I, I try to work with the chancel choir to uh, sing it with me. No, I didn't do that to them. <laughs> it is a Negro spiritual talking about the fact that what are we doing in this life here? We're already climbing up to Zion to see Jesus. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever climbed a mountain, but you know, if the mountain is too smooth, it is difficult to climb. So it is the ruggedness and the roughness of a mountain that makes it more able for us to be able to climb it up. So in this Christian experience, it may be tough, it may be difficult for us, but we've got to keep climbing up to Zion to meet our Lord. Probably need to switch over to my PowerPoint, please. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain, climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain, climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain, climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain, climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. Brothers, won't you listen? Oh, yes. Brothers, won't you listen? Oh, yes. Brothers, won't you listen? Oh, yes. I'm climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain. Climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain. Climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. Sisters, won't you listen? Oh, yes. Sisters, won't you listen? Oh, yes. Sisters, won't you listen? Oh, yes. I'm climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up, up the rough side of the mountain. Climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. I'm climbing up. Up the rough side of the mountain, climbing up to Zion to see my Lord. See the gates of yonder, oh yes. See the gates of yonder, oh yes. See the gates of yonder, oh yes. I'm climbing up to Zion, climbing up to Zion, climbing up to Zion. It is quite the journey that we must take. And part of that journey is saying to God, help me. Part of that journey is confessing to him that we have not been in as nice as we need to be. We have not treated our neighbor as we should have. We have not treated our spouse, our children, as we should have. We wanted to be kind and thoughtful, but maybe we weren't quite there. So we call ourselves to confession this morning, asking God to forgive us. Let us pray. Father, it is only because of your grace that we can ask for your forgiveness. 
It is only because of your mercy that we receive your forgiveness. So we boldly come before you now in the name of Jesus, asking you to forgive us from where we have fallen short of your will. Forgive us for not being kind in our words and deeds. Forgiving us, please, Father, not for sharing the good news when we have the opportunity. Please forgive us that we as a people will be the people that will share you, share love, and make our worlds a better place. We do thank you, Father, that you have promised to forgive us and to cleanse us, and we confess all of our sins, and I take a moment now in silence to allow each person here to ask special forgiveness for their own. willing to forgive us, give us the strength, the grace to forgive others as well. We ask these things in the most precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be assured that God has forgiven you. Are you as sure in forgiving others? Are you willing to forgive and forget? God is all-knowing. He doesn't forget but he chooses to act as though we never sinned. And we should be that way with others as well. Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from Psalm 33, verses 1 to 12, found on page 913 in the Old Testament. All you that are righteous, shout for joy for what the Lord has done. Praise him, all you that obey him. Give thanks to the Lord with harps. Sing to him with stringed instruments. Sing a new song to him. Play the harp with skill and shout for joy. The words of the Lord are true, and all his words are dependable. The Lord loves what is righteous and just. His constant love fills the earth. The Lord created the heavens by his command, the sun, moon, and stars by his spoken word. He gathered all of the seas into one place. He shut up the ocean's depths in storerooms. He worshiped the Lord, all the earth, Honor him, all people of the world. When he spoke, the world was created. At his command, everything appeared. The Lord frustrates the purposes of the nations. He keeps them from carrying out their plans. But his plans endure forever. His purpose lasts eternally. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. And our second reading is taken from Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, found in the New Testament on page 333. Just bear with me for a moment here. I know what you did. I know that you have little power. You have followed my teachings and have been faithful to me. I have opened a door in front of you which no one can close. Here endeth our readings for today. Praise be to God. There's that term that says we have come to the end of the road. Today we follow the last two churches of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3 on the imperial road. So thus we are coming to the end of the road as we look at that today. Uh, I believe there are handouts, if you wish, that will go through each of the parts of the churches as we've gone through in the past three weeks. And again, I thank you for coming back to hear it. <laughs> uh, it's been really a great experience to be here with you for these past few weeks. So today, we're looking at the Church of Philadelphia. You've heard the name before. I'm sure you know what it means, but we'll talk about it again as we look at the Church of Philadelphia today. And we read, 
To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, this is a message from the one who is holy and true. He has the key that belonged to David, and when he opens a door, no one can close it, and when he closes it, no one can open it. The only true and holy one. We're talking about Jesus. Remember, in each church, he has given an indication or description of himself. And now we know he's the only holy and true one. So we look at the Church of Philadelphia, coming down to the end of the Imperial Highway, as we have followed, starting, of course, in Ephesus all the way up. Now we're here in Philadelphia. What does it mean? What is the significance of its name? Anybody know what Philadelphia means? The city of brotherly love. You've heard it, yes? City of brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia is, named after Philadelphus, who loved his brother so dearly he was willing to die for him. It was quite a city. People were happy with each other, living well with each other, and somehow they were truly blessed in that period of experience. City of brotherly love. Parts of it still remain today, kind of reminding us of the two brothers, as it were, who became such affectionate ones with each other. But the characteristics of Philadelphia. It was a missionary city. Its founder created this city to teach everything there was about the culture at that time. Wanted everybody to understand the Hellenism is important, the language, the culture, the readings, the writings, spreading all of the Greek experience was a purpose of Philadelphia. So it was a missionary city. And understand this, that if we talk about it being a missionary city, what is the purpose of a Christian experience? What is a true purpose? What is the one thing that God tells us to do? To go, to go and make disciples, to go and preach the gospel, to go and let other people know about him. And it was during this time that many missionaries left the North America and went to other parts of the world, spreading the truth about Jesus Christ. It was an amazing experience for them. They were excited, almost like the first apostles who spent their time going from place to place telling people about Jesus Christ. So you can see Philadelphia is here. They spread all over the world, sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants us to do. Now, it is possible none of you have the ability to go to another land to share the good news. Any of you have neighbors? Any of you have coworkers? Any of you have family? What about that person who you see every time you go to the bank? We all have people we can share the good news with. Now, here is a lesson I want you to do, or homework. Ready? Every day this week, every day this week in the morning, pray that God will lead someone to you that you can share the good news with. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> every morning this week, now the children have their exercise, and you are happy to hear of their exercise. <laughs> Yours is every morning this week, pray that God will lead someone to you that you can share the good news with. And... When he does, share the good news. Sometimes we worry about the fact that, well, I don't know my Bible. Sharing the good news is not about knowing your Bible. It's about telling someone what Jesus has done for you. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Share the good news. So do that, please. And let Reverend Frank know how many people came to you and how you shared the gospel. I'd love to hear your stories. Philadelphia was found, or in a place that it was a beautiful valley. It went out into a beautiful valley and people loved to go there for all of the produce that it had. And people would come there as a gateway city into this fertile area. Philadelphia was sometimes called a little Athens because it was so much like. However, because of where it was, it was subject to frequent earthquakes. So there was a lot of turmoil in Philadelphia. And sometimes, in one of the greatest earthquakes, there was one column that stood standing after all of that. And we'll talk about that in a bit. It was also called, now, in Turkish, the City of God, Al-Kashir. The City of God is what they call it. 
So let's go on to see then. Did God have any commendations for this great city? He did. I know that you do. I know what you do. I know that you have a little power. You have followed my teaching and have been faithful to me. I have opened a door in front of you. The fact of the matter is that they really, the church at that time, had very little power. It wasn't able to do a great things that it wanted to do. They struggled with certain aspects of their relationship with God and their neighbors because they wanted to teach the Greek lifestyle, not the Christian lifestyle. But God said, continue to be faithful. I know there are ones of you who, which no one, could, uh, let me get to that again. I know that what you do. I know that you have a little power. You have followed my teaching and have been faithful to me. I have opened the door in front of you, which no one can close. Listen, as for that group that belongs to Satan, those liars who claim that they are Jews but are not, I will make them come and bow down at your feet. They will all know that I love you because you have kept my command to endure. I will also keep you safe from the time of trouble which is coming upon the world to test all the people on earth. Jesus is telling that church of Philadelphia, hold on, there's a tough time coming ahead of you, but remain faithful. You have continued to endure, you have continued to follow me, continue to do just that. Don't change in any way, shape, or form. There's a problem coming to the world, there's persecution coming to the world, but hold on. Do you think there's persecution for Christians in our world yet? Yes, there are thousands who are dying for their faith. We don't hear about it, but there are those who are giving up or losing their lives for their faith. And sometimes we won't give up our bed for our faith. If the weather's too bad, I understand, but we live in Canada. People go to hockey games in horrible weather. People go to football games in freezing cold and take off their jackets to prove they're fans. But then I can't go to church. Hold on, my friends. So Jesus continues to speak to the church of Philadelphia, a beautiful church. And this is unique in this experience. Jesus has reproved the churches for where they were falling short. But for the church of Philadelphia, he has no reproof. Wouldn't that be nice? If there was one week we went through and nobody complained about us, one day, wouldn't it be nice if nobody had a complaint? Jesus has no complaint about the church of Philadelphia. They are so in love with him. And when you love Jesus so much, you gotta love other people. You gotta be willing to love other people because if Jesus loves them, you got to love them. That's a tough thing to do sometimes, and especially as we celebrate black history. Sometimes we forget that everybody was made by Jesus Christ. Not just the good-looking ones, but everybody was made by Jesus Christ. So he comes on to give counsel to the church of Philadelphia. So if he has no reproof, what counsel could he give them? They must be perfect if he has no reproof. But just, God, just because God does not have a reproof doesn't mean we don't need to grow. The Christian experience is a growing experience. We cannot sit on our laurels and expect that, oh, I'll be all right. We have to keep growing. We have to keep reading. We have to keep praying. We have to keep studying so that we know who he is. So what is the reproof, I should say, the counsel that he gives to the Church of Philadelphia? Keep safe what you have. I am coming soon. Keep safe what you have, so no one will rob you of your victory prize. Keep on keeping on. Don't give up now. You've come so far, why give up now? When persecution hits, why give up? You have made it so far. Don't give up now. Sometimes God needs to remind us that the prize is not this earth. God's greatest gift to us is not this earth. 
It is heaven. It is the earth to come. It is what God offers to all of his children. Hold on. I'm going to take care of you. Hold on. You will be with me forever. That's the promise that he gives you. And God tells us that he has a crown for us. A crown that he lays before us. He has an open door before us. No one will shut that door. God doesn't turn anyone away from salvation. When we accept him, come to him, he stands there with open arms. And that's how he wants us to be with others as well. So here now the door is open. Two great political things happened in 1776 in the United States of America, of course. 1789 over in Europe which opened the doors to the word of God for the world. People were ready to hear the good news. And it is at this time that many missionaries again went out telling people the good news. And that's the option that God gives to us today to tell the good news. You have a new child. How old? Six weeks. So when your baby was born, you didn't tell anybody about it. No, not a soul. Not a, and you probably don't have a single picture of that baby. No. Nah. Don't have a single one. They have 10 million. Not a single one. That's what God wants our Christian experience to be. It is exciting. It is continually growing, continually new, and we want to let people know about this God that we serve. That's who God wants us to be. Thus he says to us, I am coming soon. Keep safe what you have so that no one will rob you of your victory prize. Then he goes on to say, in his promise, I will make those who are victorious pillars, remember those pillars that remained after the earthquake, I will make those who are victorious pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never leave it. I will write on them the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which will come down out of heaven from my God, I will also write on them my new name. What a promise God makes to us as his children. Even in spite of the earthquakes and the struggles that they had, one pillar stood to remind them that that's what God wants to do in our experience. He wants us to be able to stand. Even if we are the only one standing, God wants us to stand. I know what you do. I know that you have a little power. You have followed my teaching and have been faithful to me. I have opened a door in front of you which no one, no one will close. What a special promise for you if you are in the Church of Philadelphia today. No one can close your door to salvation. Don't let anyone close the door to your salvation. One of the Negro spirituals says, don't you let nobody turn you around. Keep on to Galilee. So that's the Church of Philadelphia today. So we go to the last church today of the seven churches, and that is the Church of Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, this is the message from the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the origin of all that God created. Jesus says, I'm it. I'm the amen. I'm the one who started it all, and I'm the one who will finish it all. Jesus says, I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. If we hang on to him at the beginning, in the middle, we'll be holding on to him until the end. Laodicea today is a great site for people to visit. Doesn't have much else going on there. But it's an interesting city nonetheless. Tells us a lot about the end church. Remember, we can be in each of the churches, I believe, spiritually. But we are historically in the last church of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. So what is the meaning of this church? What is the significance of this church? It is the judging of the people. We don't like that word very well. Judge. 
It even sounds bad. Judge. Because it means there's a decision going to be made that potentially cannot be reversed. And maybe that's why we don't like that word. Stop judging me, we say to people when they say stuff about us. This city was built by Antiochus and Teochus the second, around 261 to 246 BC. It talks about it in Daniel 11 as well. Being the last church, there's something that God really needs for us to understand for this period and time. It is called, it was, besides a beautiful city, many things happened in the city of Laodicea. They became very rich for one express, express reason. They were a city of compromise. Whatever, we'll do it for you. Whatever, whatever, whatever. That's what made them so rich. So they went from the extremes of being really nice to being whatever they needed to be to make friends with whomever they wanted to be friends with. And because of their compromising, they weren't really a, a, anything. Do you have friends like that? They're friendly to that person, friendly to that person, then when they're friendly with that person, they're not nice to you because you just don't know what to expect from a person like that. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the church of Laodicea. You need to be something. You need to make a stand for something. Laodicea was a rich city, again, probably because they did whatever they could for whomever. Coins started in this city. They also created the black wool, a special kind of wool that made express use in that area, that showed how rich you were. Because you could do that, you could wear that. They were rich people. But they were compromising. They were giving up their faith to get their riches. And do we do that sometimes? Well, the job asked me to do this, and I know it's not quite right, but I really need the job. Well, my job wants me to work at a certain time, and I know I shouldn't be working then, have we compromised people? Have we given up what God wants from us just to make it in this day and age? Now, please hear me clearly. I'm just asking a question. I don't know how you live. Do you speak differently with your coworkers than you do at home? Do you swear and cuss like they do at work and then at home you try to have a clean tongue? Are you compromising, is the question I ask. Do people know what you believe? Or if they walked into church right now, they'd say, I didn't know you were a Christian. Have we been compromising? There's also a special powder created in Laodicea. It was called an eye salve to help eyes see better. So there was a lot that went on in Laodicea. Also, Laodicea had hot springs. Lovely hot springs to go in and soak. Somewhat like in Bath, I guess. Probably smelled badly as it does here, but it, nonetheless, there were hot springs, sulfur hot springs. And they also had, in that city, a great medical school. Remember we talked about it before, the look of the medical emblem of the snake on a stick just as Moses, when they were bitten by the fiery serpents. Moses was told to put a serpent on a stick, and those who looked up at the stick would live. That was the city of Laodicea. Many people found ways to get out of there and to find firm refuge in the rocks nearby when some of the trouble, troubles began for them. There was an important church council that happened, the Council of Laodicea, which was held in that city. And the importance of it was to say, listen, folks, we got to go back to the Bible. We got to trust God's word. We have to believe God's word. It's not about what man says. It's about what God says. So he has given us a meaning 
commendation. Commendation, wait. He has commended a lot of the churches. Does he have any commendation for the church of Laodicea? Hmm. What do you think? He had no commendation for the church of Laodicea. Tell me, do you love me? How would you feel? Do you care about me? That's how God felt about the church of Laodicea. No commendation for them. Because they had compromised so much, they truly lost out on what God wanted for them. The reproof of the city is that they were a lukewarm church. Remember, they had the hot springs. And then they would send the water down from the hot springs through the viaducts into the city. Hot up there, traveling through cool stone, what do you think happens to the water? Becomes lukewarm. Probably looked even as good as that. It became lukewarm, and I don't know about you, I like room temperature. I can't do hot, hot stuff. And cold, cold stuff, not too much. But lukewarm when you're expecting hot is not a good thing. How many people have thrown away their coffee because it was lukewarm? I love that song. Yeah. So Jesus really doesn't call them hypocrites. So we have to be careful with that. He does not call them hypocrites because a hypocrite tries to be one thing here and a different thing here. They were just lukewarm. They didn't care. They didn't want to do anything because they thought they were okay. They thought they were rich because they had their black wool and their coins. They thought they could see. They thought they had everything they needed. But God said to them, no, my friends, here's what I suggest that you do. Buy of me. God wants to give the church of Laodicea everything that they need to survive. God wants to give us everything that we need to walk in this Christian life. And he offers it to us freely. What we do with it then is the issue at hand. So he says to them, you may think you're rich, but you're not. You may think your Christian experience is good enough because you do this, you do that, you have done this, you have done that, I'm okay. But Jesus says, no, you're not. You need to buy of me gold tried in fire, that then you may be rich. Now, I've never seen the process, but I'm told that they burn gold until the dross, the ugly stuff gets off it, and then it's pure gold. That's what God has to do to us sometimes, my friends. He has to burn off that other stuff so we can be pure in him. And we don't like that burning experience. It's too hot. It hurts. But if in the end it grants us salvation, who cares? If God has to put you through something to get your attention... Let him do that so that you can be saved. I once heard a guy say, you know, I was just so busy I couldn't see God that he had to finally knock me on my back so I could look up and see him. And sometimes God has to do that. He has to get our attention sometimes in an ugly way. But if it saves you, thank him for that. Job says, yet God knows every step I take if he tests me, he will find me pure. That's what God wants from his children. Purity through the blood of Jesus Christ. So try buy of me gold tried in fire that you may be rich. Then he says, white raiment that you may be clothed. Remember the white raiment. We talked about before, showing sign of authority. 
But they were proud of their black wool, their black outfits that they could wear to show how rich they were. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. So Jesus told them they had to buy of him white raiment. One of the elders asked me, who are these people dressed in white robes and where do they come from? I don't know, sir. You do. I answered, he said to me, these are the people who have come safely through the terrible persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the lamb. Whiter than snow, he has washed our clothes. He has covered us with his robe of righteousness. So, so far, the gold, he has given it to us. He has cleansed it. He has made it pure. It is now his robe of righteousness that we wear. Fire, gold, tried in fire. White raiment that we may be covered. And then he says, buy of me, I salve that you may see. They thought they had everything that they needed. They had their special colorium to help with the eyesight. But God realized that they didn't see him. They weren't seeing him. They were seeing all the stuff that was before them. And as Jesus did to the blind man on the road that day, when he asked him, what do you want from me? Jesus asked him, the blind man answered, I want to see again. And Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. At once he was able to see and follow Jesus on the road. We are living in a day when people don't want to know who Jesus is. We are living in a country that is a Christian country. Our neighbors to the north, south, <laughs> Christian country, but we aren't able to talk about Christ. We can't pray in our schools. God wants his people to be righteous. God wants us to know that he loves us dearly and he wants us to have a relationship with him. All through Jesus Christ, not through anything of our own. There's a lovely term in, in theology called justification justified. You are justified through Jesus Christ, just as if I'd never sinned. And God wants us to have that experience daily, where we are just in him. Then we grow in him, called sanctification. We become more and more like Jesus Christ. And he wants us to do that on a daily basis. I don't know about you, have you ever gone out to play softball on Sunday? You haven't touched anything, you haven't run all week, but you play hard for Sunday. What happens Sunday night and Monday morning? Oh, I, I can't move. And you finally get back to walking again on Friday. Oh yeah, I'm going to go play on Sunday again. You haven't learned. It's got to be a daily experience. It has to be the experience that we go through every day, walking in him, walking and becoming more like him. So Jesus wants us. He wants us to be a part of his experience. He says, I promise you, if you do what I've just suggested, you'll be able to sit with me in my throne. What a beautiful promise for the church of Laodicea. None of the churches has God saying, I'm done with you. I don't need you. Get out of my face. Each of them, he makes a promise. If you do this, this is what will happen to you. He stands at the door knocking, hoping that we will become what he wants us to be. Not a place that is a nice sight for people to see, but a place where we walk and talk and become what Jesus wants us to be. So if you are in any of the churches we've talked about for the past few weeks, there's an issue of sin and grace. Because of sin, we are deprived of the tree of life from Adam and Eve. But through grace, God restores us to the tree of life. Because of sin, we are put under the death sentence. But because of grace, we will have victory over the second death. 
Because of sin, we are sent out to earn our own bread. But through grace, God provides us with hidden manna. Sin stole our dominion, our control over this world. Grace promises us power over every nation. Sin left us naked. Grace clothes us in white raiment. Sin drove us from God's presence. Grace pledges us. We go out no more from his presence. Sin returned us to dust. Grace places us on the throne of God. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus stands at the door knocking. Sound? And he wants us to listen to his voice and trust him and know that he is coming again soon. And when he comes again soon, he wants to take us home with him. I stand ye gazing there up into the sky. Be not discouraged, for we have brought good news. This same Jesus whom we do magnify. Soon he will come again for all to glorify. He is coming again. He is coming Coming again On Calvary He paid my destiny Lord, I humble myself To I want to see your face Just help me to be strong I know you come again It won't be very long He is coming again he is coming again, Son of the Father. He is coming again. On Calvary, he paid my destiny. Lord, I humble myself. Up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Amen. 
It is my prayer for each one of us, whichever church you may be in spiritually, that you will heed what Jesus asks. You will watch for his promise and trust that he will take us home with him when he comes again. But for today, let us take time to be holy. Each day, let us ask him to be present with us. And remember your assignment. Each day, ask God to lead somebody to you so that you can share the good news. Let us sing our hymn, number 672, Take Time to Be Holy. children are here thanking you, thanking you that you give us the opportunity to become more like Jesus Christ, thanking you that you give us the opportunity to trust you, to listen to your word and to be changed in your word. So we pray for the people of this church, of this community, those who strive to follow you and want to become more like you. We pray for those who are sick. We ask for your healing hand upon them. And even in their sickness, help them to feel your presence and know that you are there. We pray for those around our country, around this world, who are struggling, being enslaved to some form of addiction, some issue that won't let them go. We ask for their release, their emancipation from that, so that they can learn and trust in you more. We pray for those countries where there is strife and war, where people are being killed for their faith, where people are being shot for no good reason whatsoever. We pray for them and their families to find rest and peace. We pray for our country and its leaders that they will remember what you have done for them, that they will remember why this country was founded, that they will remember in whose name we truly should trust. So bless us, Father, 
and keep us in your care. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Oh, please be seated. Sorry. So I commission you with your homework experience. I'm saying it, what now, a third time. You know what God wants from you this week. Your commission is to go out there and pray that God will lead what? Somebody to you so that you can what? Share the good news. And take the opportunity to share the good news. So go in peace. Go in grace. Go in the hope of our soon coming Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is my prayer for each one of us this day. Amen. downstairs with some CDs if you are interested. <laughs> <laughs>